My guest today is Peter Cowley. He's a former NDM top executive and the founder and CEO of Spirit Studios. Spirit Studios is a media production company and multi-award winning podcast studio. In this episode, we discuss the framework that Peter uses to build social media audiences, how Spirit Studios generated millions of views on YouTube for one of their podcasts, what audience growth looked like in the early days of the show, and how marketing and data inform the production process, including the choice of guests and the questions they're asked, plus much more. Enjoy. Hi, Peter. Thank you so much for coming on the show. My pleasure. Thank you for inviting me. I wanted to ask you because Spirit Studios is working on many different, was producing many different shows. Why do you go for a specific genre and what are the differences between promoting, uh, say, true crime versus entertainment? Um, well, very good question. I think uh, Spirit Studios has been producing podcasts for over five years now, but uh, Spirit Studios has been around for 10 years. And we were really keen to trade on our expertise as an entertainment producer or talent-led entertainment producer. And we began producing podcasts which were you know, chat shows with uh, influencers or TV personalities to begin with. So uh, the genre that we specialize in at the moment is broadly around entertainment, whether that be comedy or other forms of entertainment, um, mostly hosted by talent that have some sort of social media influence or you know, general TV influence. Our biggest podcast that we run is called Private Parts, which is hosted by Jamie Lane, who is a reality TV star from the UK on a show called Made in Chelsea that's been going for many years. And that's got us going in this area. We tend to have focused on this entertainment or influence area rather than drifting into true crime or drama or history firstly is our expertise but secondly we're quite a commercial organization and our view was that you could probably make more money in podcasting by leveraging a talent's social media following or their influence somewhere else um, to get the advertising budgets that might have advertised around that celebrity or talent's social media to now put that money into podcasting. And that's held us very well over the past five years. A lot of our shows are focused in that genre of entertainment or influencer talent. We've begun looking further afield more recently because we, we've grown as a podcast studio. That makes total sense, right? Piggybacking on, on the fame of, of certain uh, social media influencers. It's funny what you say because we've recently seen exactly that in the true crime niche with Spotify commissioning a show, uh, a true crime show being presented by Kim Kardashian. So it's trying to merge be the best of the both worlds, which I thought was was an interesting try. And they actually I haven't followed uh, the success of the show, but they had a very strong start as far as I can remember, although some people are, were a bit taken aback by the, the choice for, for of Kim Kardashian. I think Spotify probably know what they're doing. And uh... Yeah, one of the major areas of promotion that we lever is obviously the talents influence social media following. And that's been harder in genres like maybe true crime, as you say, because the the hosts or the presenters aren't necessarily as famous. So, yeah, they're mixing the genres there, Spotify. When we have seen in genres like history, um, leveraging the talent or host capability in the UK. Dan Snow, who hosts History Hit TV, is a well-known TV personality and obviously a historian. So again, being able to blend the two capabilities to produce a successful uh, brand um, in the UK and overseas. In one of your answers, you mentioned Private Parts, which is a very successful show uh, with you know, millions of views on, on YouTube and Instagram Reels, TikTok. I, I do want to ha ask specific questions about the show uh, a bit later on in, in this episode. But first, can you walk us through your you know framework for audience development on social media for the shows that you develop? 
we're big believers uh, in social media and video, actually, to be great promoters of the type of podcasts that we create. Again, because they're talent-led or influencer-led, a lot of the existing audience of our hosts want to not only listen to them, they would like to see them as well. And as a, by background, Spirit is a TV and video producer that became a podcast producer. So part of the package we tend to always put together is both the audio and the video together. With private parts, we actually began not only recording that as all in audio, but we recorded that with video from pretty much day one, put it out as long form YouTube episodes, as well as putting out as um, audio episodes as much. You know, we felt that the younger audience that might listen or in this case, want to watch private parts, their go-to route for podcasting was via video rather than via audio. So uh, the initial strategy was tr to try and uh, address that sort of younger demographic that wanted to watch their hosts rather than just listen to them. The uh, older you get, maybe as you commute or listen to your podcast, Walking a Dog, uh, your uh, behavior might change. But that was the core of what we did. And we've kept that sort of video-based um, approach uh, through a lot of our podcasts that we now produce. The Secret 2 with uh, Vicky Patterson, some uh, Spotify podcasts that we create are all video-led to give that full 360-degree experience. That could be long-form YouTube videos that you mentioned. It could be shorts on YouTube. But we've increasingly found that TikTok is a great platform for a video content short form, obviously, that could transfer into listenership. That's probably of all the platforms at the moment where we get the best conversion rate from social media to audio listening, particularly for that Gen Z audience. Obviously, if you're trying to address a slightly older demographic, other platforms can be used. And so on private parts, we majored on bringing a younger audience in the last six months via TikTok we've already got an established community on Instagram via Reels and on YouTube, like you mentioned. And we use that, um, we sort of copy and paste that strategy for the relevant podcasts that need to leverage those communities or platforms. Got it. So you, you kind of answered my, my next question, which is, um, you know, how you select the, the social media platforms that you leverage, you know, to grow social audiences. So for you, it's would it be fair to say that it's mostly demographics based, knowing that you know fair a fair bit of of the audience of this show is young, uh, belongs to Gen Z, maybe millennials. You go for these platforms, TikTok, Instagram Reels, um, etc. Yes, broadly, I think that's correct. Uh, the younger the audience we're attracting, the more you go to TikTok. The uh, the older maybe Facebook and uh, probably Instagram and YouTube sit somewhere in the middle. Um, it also depends on whether we want to push out the longer form full episode or just use the social media uh, networks as promotional devices. We tend to look at the social media platforms as both opportunities to commercialize the audience as well as promote, sometimes both, or sometimes we just tend to use them as promotional. But uh, for example, on some of our uh, podcasts, we are looking to commercialize through advertising on YouTube or through creative funds on TikTok, et cetera, et cetera. Um, or, you know, the subscription capabilities that you get through some of the platforms as well. So again, it's a holistic look at whether the objective is just audience building or is it audience building and commercialization. But you're right. Ultimately, demographics probably decides which platform we would go for. Interesting. Can you tell us which platform monetizes the best from all the platforms you've mentioned? I think probably for private parts, it's probably YouTube. We've been on YouTube since the beginning. So uh, we've had five plus years chance to build that audience. Um, it's not as big as the audience we have on um, Spotify or Apple, but it's a, a loyal audience and they're there to get... I guess something extra from the podcast, from the video as well. So that probably, from a commercial point of view, is our most successful platform. Whilst probably TikTok is the most uh, successful platform from a purely promotional point of view. 
at the moment, again, if you're aiming for that Gen Z or younger millennial audience, which are obviously using that as a platform, particularly over the last six to 12 months. Interesting. Okay, let's, let's talk about YouTube then. Uh, Private Parts has close to or even above, slightly above 40,000 subscribers um, at the time of this episode. Can you tell us how audience growth looked in the early days of you using YouTube for Private Parts? Well, I'll, I'll sort of expand uh, that question slightly to give a little bit of context. When we launched Private Parts, as I said, five plus years ago, podcast aimed at a younger female audience was slightly unusual. Obviously, time has changed and younger female audiences are probably some of the biggest audiences on uh, podcast networks. But back five years ago, Private Parts was quite new aiming at that demographic, you know, picking up that reality TV audience with Jamie Lang as the host. Um, so uh, YouTube was probably the biggest platform of the of that moment alongside the podcast uh, platform that could be monetized but um, private parts wasn't very successful for the first year again a younger female audience hadn't really engaged with podcasts at the time so it did take us a year to really get momentum behind both the podcast and the youtube platform itself and we were naive and ignorant at the time and um, probably just doing the podcast for fun as an extra piece of content rather than, you know, strong strategy to grow a big brand. But after a year, we worked out by trial and error that probably what every podcast producer knows that if you get guests, you can inherit the audience from those guests. And you can be begin building an audience, not only using the social media or the video capability of YouTube to distribute the content, but leveraging the guest social media audience or fan base as well. Once we worked that out, which sounds pretty daft these days, but um, that was, uh, I guess, the second string to our bow, using guest audience alongside social media with the first two planks of our audience building strategy that has obviously fared both ourselves and other people very well over the past um, yeah, four or five years. I'd probably add to that, you know, Jamie and our other co-hosts of Private Parts going on to other people's podcasts as well. That's probably the third plank of our audience building strategy. Again, if Jamie or a co-host or a host goes on someone else's platform, hopefully you can introduce that audience to Private Parts or, you know, one of our other podcasts as well. So over the years, we've built up a little shopping list of promotional devices which we know works yeah that could be you know on the long list you've got those three that i've mentioned which is uh, social media inheriting the guest audience going on other people's podcasts i would add to that pr sometimes we do sometimes we do paid uh, activity we're beginning to look at seo as an important part of searching for podcasts and so on and so on and so on but yeah Probably the fourth biggest one from is getting either Spotify, Apple, or some of the other podcast platforms to help promote you if they feel it's editorially significant to their audience. So, for example, we run a podcast called Homo Sapiens, which is focused on the LGBTQ plus uh, community around the world. So, in Pride Month in June, uh, yeah, that gets good promotion from the podcast platforms because it's relevant to the sort of editorial calendar to what those um, platforms want to promote. Interesting. That's actually one of the questions I wanted to ask you. Um, you know, when when you have the, the chance to be selected for an, an editorial speak, what, what is the, um, the effect on downloads and, and views that you usually see? I think over the years, uh, the impact of the editorial promotion from the big podcast platforms has changed a bit you know two or three years ago it had quite a significant impact and it was a great way of introducing people or enabling people to discover your podcast i think as the world's got bigger in terms of the number of podcasts out there and it's more competitive that impact is still there but it does, isn't quite as significant in our experience it needs to probably work alongside some of the other audience development um, strategies that we have. So 
don't get me wrong, I like getting promotion from those platforms, but it probably does need to be part of an integrated promotional plan or strategy that you have. So it sits alongside great social media, going on other people's podcasts, PR, whatever the, the other thing is. And increasingly, you know, our interest is looking at other significant ways of growing audience, SEO, we've talked about before, and others. So, you know, we've got a long list of things that we try and apply to our podcast, depending on who the audience is, the genre of the content, and which countries we're focused on. A lot of our podcasts are very UK centric, but increasingly we've been looking to produce podcasts that might be popular overseas. One of the podcasts that has significant audience overseas, the moment that we help is called Pit Stop. It's a Formula One focused uh, podcast for the Gen Z audience that might have got into Formula One through Netflix's Drive to Survive. And we're certainly finding the audience is spread around the world. Yeah, it's in the English language, so it's the larger English-speaking communities from like the US, the UK, South Africa, Australia, New Zealand, Canada that are picking out first. But we've certainly seen a bigger spread, which does uh, mean our promotional audience development strategy needs to be a bit wider. So these editorial picks are uh, not going to double your audience overnight, except if you have a very small audience to begin with, but it's not uh, something you should count on and hope for to completely you know have your audience growth explode overnight is what you're saying you yes, mentioned correct. that you leverage paid sometimes what are your uh, go-to paid channels for podcast promotion we've experimented with a quite a few paid for channels over the years whether that be social media or television or posters but probably my go-to you paid for route is probably around podcasts we believe that if you're listening to a podcast and you might get a paid ad in it you're more likely to listen to our podcast that we're promoting rather than you seeing an advert on tv social media or posters so yeah probably if we were to spend money at the moment it would be on podcast advertising rather than other forms of media including social media at the moment although i think that is a route to go down if you're starting up a brand new podcast from scratch. But I guess we tend to leverage the social reach or influence of our hosts to do that, to get the, the sort of community growing rather than using paid for. So let's go back to YouTube and private parts a bit. I see that you very diligently leverage uh, YouTube shorts for private parts. You have dozens, if not hundreds of videos there. Have you seen any effect on first subscriber growth for the channel from leveraging shorts? And what's the impact on, on viewership? Any impact between our sort of promotional channels and podcasts are quite difficult to measure. There are sort of many mechanisms for direct correlation of um, views on YouTube to listens on uh, our podcast platforms. So difficult question to answer, but what I would say is do find that with certain guests, we get uh, little spikes on our audience on the podcast network when, when the YouTube networks have done well. For example, our very first episode at the beginning of 2023 was a previous uh, made in Chelsea reality star who hadn't been on the podcast for probably three or four years. And we found that our audience who likes made in Chelsea likes to see our guests. I've mentioned before that the sort of visual part of uh, recording our podcast is important if people want to actually see the, the guests or the hosts. So we certainly found that the YouTube shorts and the longer YouTube content does very well with that sort of guest and seems to translate into more audience on the podcast network. I can't do an apples for apples comparison because again, uh, we don't count the links or the, we are able to count the links at this stage. On other platforms like TikTok, we see uh, probably able to measure it a bit better because if someone is watching a clip on TikTok, we tend to find they come and listen to our podcast through Spotify because there's a much closer relationship between 
TikTok use and Spotify use rather than TikTok to Apple. Again, it's an age demographic issue, I think. So again, uh, I won't say it's solid market research analysis, but it is sort of trend type information where we'll see uh, higher than average TikTok viewership translate into higher than average Spotify listenership. If you see what it make less less of an impact on Apple. So we sort of look at the analytics and the trends. We can't make direct comparisons, but we get a sense of what works or what doesn't. And that's the best we can do at the moment. Yeah, that, that's a fascinating insight. I mean, now that you say, you know, it's kind of uh, everything's uh, uh, obvious in hindsight. Uh, but you, you know, saying that there's a, a high correlation between a TikTok viewership, TikTok numbers, and, and Spotify activity than on Apple. Uh, I, I wouldn't have necessarily thought about that, but now that you say it, it's, uh, it makes total sense. What about the impact of, of YouTube Shorts on viewership when it comes to long-form content on YouTube? That, that was my initial question. I couldn't necessarily focus down to the difference between Shorts and long-form on YouTube and the impact on uh, podcast listening. I mean, I think we're quite excited by YouTube beginning to monetize shorts from the 1st of February 2023 and the impact on the commercialization of our YouTube channel. But I wouldn't be able to say that, again, there's a direct correlation between viewership of our shorts and listenership of our podcast. As I've said before, it's part of the package. We feel we do need to do that. But we haven't seen uh, the same significant bumps that we probably get from TikTok to through to Spotify listening through Shorts yet. But it's probably too early to say. It's in our armory of tools that we use, but I can't say hand on heart how well it works. But because we have a significant social media team working on creating clips and content assets, is relatively cost effective and easy to, to, to deploy those clips uh, to different platforms. We we tend to be in favor of not generically posting content onto all the platforms. We like to understand the, the form factor of the content, how well it will work on each platform. So yeah, YouTube shorts can be very short. YouTube long form can be very long, whilst TikTok could be two, three, four minutes, Snapchat, similar. Uh, each platform is very different and we'll tailor the content assets or the creative to each of the platforms to try and get the best possible impact. Interesting. When I did my research, I, I did, you know, found all your presence, IG Reels, TikTok, YouTube Shorts. And like, of course, I didn't like, you know, watch all of them. Uh, so I didn't notice that the, the formats were tailored. I was about to ask you, you, you seem to be posting the exact same content on the, all those different platforms and which type of content or which video is the most successful seems to like widely vary from platform to platform. So first, like the, the fact that you tell her starts to uh, provide a beginning of an explanation. What, what's your take in general, like what performs well on, on a platform versus another? Yeah, I think... Uh, the tailoring of our content by platform, it can be very small changes sometimes, or it could be a completely different clip. Uh, you know, we are conscious that each platform works in a different way. But to give you an example, in 2022, we shifted quite heavily from producing Instagram Reels to on private parts to producing TikTok and only a few Reels. Just again, through that uh, anecdotal experience information that we're getting back and back we felt that the performance of tiktok through to um audio as i said particularly through spotify was a positive thing to do and instagram wasn't translating quite so much again the sort of uh, there are a number of reasons why that platform doesn't seem to work as well as it used to i'm not an expert on the nuances of each of the platform but as a team we sort of analyze and review and make changes or experiment to see how things go. But it could be that uh, one clip that does well on one platform, we might well just tweak it slightly and put it out on another just to see how well it does. But I do think there is quite significant behavioral differences and demographic differences between each of the platforms and what why people go to that platforms 
or how they discover content on those platforms. So, yeah, having a team that uh, use those insights and keep an eye on the statistics and uh, data that we get back and feed that back into the creative process is really important. For example, we had a guest on Private Parts in 2022 who was slightly older than our normal um, uh, guest on Private Parts. So we didn't necessarily think it would work, that clips of that might work on um, platforms or social platforms for younger demographics. But one of the clips really did well. And it was because the guest started talking about a subject that was relevant to a younger audience. And again, we begin learning about what type of stories or clips will engage what type of audience. It's not just the guest or the podcast, it's the story that that guest might tell. So, for example, in this clip I'm talking about, they mentioned how much something cost. That probably for a younger audience was quite an interesting anecdote that came out of the podcast and that clip then did well on on TikTok, on Instagram Reels, where we didn't think it possibly would. You know, had he picked that guest, uh, oh, it no. wasn't appealed to our slightly older um, audience members. So again, you sort of got to get your head around the number of factors here. Obviously, which clip you pick, but what story are they telling? What relevance is that guest or that story to your audience? And then you pick the social platforms relevant to it. It's a bit, you know, it's partly a the understanding of what engages audiences really on it by platform. So you're very deliberate about like the the types of clips or the content of the clips that you upload to uh, a platform or another. It's not like you're uh, throwing, you know, everything at the wall and trying to see what sticks, or at least you did that in the beginning, but now you're much more deliberate about that choice. So does that also inform how the host, uh, like what types of questions they ask or how they orient the the debates on on the show uh, because they know this is going to be gold for for clips and so they go for that type of questions for example totally we're big believers in prepping for our guest interviews and having you don't, you don't always get it right but having a sense of what questions stroke answers may work on social media to best promote the podcast so you know we're believers that making a podcast is 50% production, 50% marketing and distribution. So as we pick the guests, pick the questions we ask, we're already thinking about how we might hopefully promote that episode using the social media or PR or whatever it might be. Yeah, we don't always get that right because you don't always get the answer that you want uh, or are expecting from the guests. But certainly our producers will have researched the guests before they come on and be thinking about that audience engagement to our community as much as making a great podcast episode. Super interesting. We've talked a lot about, you know, audiences, Gen Z, et cetera. Do you mind, you know, walking us through your methodology for audience research? Yeah, we've got our producers, teams working on each podcast. We'll you know, rig each week talk about the editorial and the creative that we're going to create in to each podcast, but that's informed by a number of bits of data. One might be previous audience numbers that we're getting from you know, the ACASTs or uh, megaphones or platforms that we're using. So that sort of audience data in terms of listenership, downloads or streams is obviously hugely important, even down to what sort of player that they're getting on, because again, we see demographic differences between Spotify, Apple and other platforms. The countries that they're coming through, the feedback that we're getting through social media, you know, people regularly uh, DM us or talk about the content on social media, or they, on Apple, might leave reviews, hopefully five-star reviews, but not always uh, five-star reviews. So all of that information goes into a sort of development melting pot. And, you know, we work across at any one time, 10 plus podcasts. So each of the producers can share insights from each of their different guests that come on, the successes and failures that they might have had, or, you know, improvements in best practice. So that all goes into um, trying to make a better podcast than the one we did before. And, you know, trying to be competitive with yourself to do that. Yeah, we come from a background of producing YouTube videos and Facebook and Instagram and Snapchat. 
And I guess the same principles work. Digital and audio platforms produce a lot of data and insights. How do you use that to be, be a feedback loop into what you create next time? So that could be uh, yeah, picking the social platforms, how many clips we do, the type of questions we ask, or even adapting the formats. Uh, we're just about to launch a new strand on private parts, which is sort of promoting some of the back episodes that we've done. Yeah, we now have hundreds and hundreds of back episodes and some of our new audience members tell us that they, you know, they discover, you know, go back to the beginning or listen to previous episodes and they'd love to be, discover those episodes, you know, what Jamie or the other hosts think are the be- best episodes. So, you know, leveraging that, that whole catalogue of content that we've got already could be quite new to a new listener rather than assume that everyone's listened to every episode already. So all of that info informs format, guests, social media, marketing, development going forwards. It's a sort of holistic approach to trying to make the best experience for our audience, which also commercializes, so it's got to work for the brand partners that we work with as well. But I think we'd say we're audience first, but want to be brand friendly along the way. You mentioned you're actually, you know, video first uh, because of, you know, the history of of Spirit Studio. What is your typical process for, you know, translating video into audio? Do you have certain things that you add to the audio track to make it podcastable? Yeah, this, each podcast we produce, we have a slightly different view of whether you, whether the video leads the audio or the audio leads the video. We tend to always video our podcasts and certain podcasts particularly the younger skewing ones tend to be video first uh, because again the younger you are the more video centric you seem to be in terms of how you uh, consume content sometimes we won't make any changes between the video and audio versions so they're direct copies of each other whether we've edited the video first or edited the audio first we sort of sync the two together and sometimes we feel that a piece of content might be more visual and doesn't really work audio only, so we might cut it out the audio, but let the audience know from a cross-promotional point of view that they can get more if they wanted to see what happened, go across to YouTube or wherever it is, and you'll get to get a bit of extra content as well. We don't do that too much because we like to not necessarily take content away from our core audiences on audio or you know youtube or other platforms but it is a way that if something's difficult to explain in audio you can get to see it in our studio or remotely video recorded uh, on one of our video platforms because you explicitly advertise this in the audio track saying this content is you know best uh, enjoyed in a video format uh, visit our youtube channel or something yeah we don't often do that but if we did feel that someone was doing something in our studio that's very visual then we would flag it up as something that uh, you might want to watch on social media or youtube to get the full experience it's not common but it is a technique that we use do you ever look at the list of you know gen z's favorite personalities favorite famous people uh and go oh we should actually invite these people because they would do great on the show yeah we have quite a sophisticated guest strategy on all of our podcasts we subscribe to some services which tell you which guests or talent are in town for example we share which guests have done well on some of our other podcasts we look at whose podcasts are doing well at the moment or whose podcasts are doing well and have had great guests on them so i think guests are super important across our whole portfolio on the podcasts that we produce so getting the right blend of guests which match the audience that we want uh, is really important. So yeah, we use those tools and our own insights into who we think could work well or is growing well in the podcast world. We'll also ask you know our distribution partners who they think would be good guests or we often get a lot of incoming, particularly to our bigger podcast people, wanting to be guests because they're promoting something they're on a junket or they just people think there's a good fit with the podcast or 
that guest has a podcast and they want to promote it. So we're forever filtering the appropriate guest to the appropriate podcast that we run. What's your view on audience development for podcasts in 2023? Um, Spirit's view of audience development in 2023 is that we're increasingly working in a very competitive space. There are more and more podcasts. We're all competing to the same audience numbers. So we believe we've probably got to be more selective about which podcasts we produce, particularly the ones we produce and promote. Because uh, the Spirit not only runs our own podcast, we also produce podcasts for other people like Spotify or BBC Studios. And in those cases, those platforms will probably do their own audience development, albeit with our some of our help. So for the podcasts that we um, produce and distribute ourselves, I think we need to get a bit pickier in terms of picking the subjects, the guests, the hosts that we really think there might be a gap in the market that we can grow that audience um, and not go into sort of saturated areas where it's increasingly difficult to be heard. But I think we're going to double down on social media promotion better or you know more informed guest booking and increasingly looking at new tools for discovery whether that be through search through seo or optimizing our sort of paid for strategy around paying for podcast promotion on other people's networks we already can cross promote across our own network of podcasts and we think that's quite successful but if we want to bring new audiences into our network or our podcast, we probably will need to invest more money in um, podcast promotion is our strategy. So I think 2023 is going to be much more difficult than 2022, which was more difficult than 21 because of the competitive nature of it. So being more focused, bigger, better, fewer is probably our strategy and putting more effort into each individual podcast rather than trying to spread ourselves too thin and you know always be looking out for you know, trends or the changes in the market and being on top of them when they happen whether that be you know just amazing guests different social media platforms through to better analytics tools thank you so much for coming on the show where can people follow you and and spirit studio uh spirit studios is www.spirit-studios.com where you can get to all of our podcasts and other content studios that we run. Hope you come and listen to us as well on uh, Apple, Spotify. We do have a producer channel on Apple that you can get to again called Spirit Studios. Then I also had fun, uh, you know, watching some of the uh, the episodes of Pride Apart. So uh, also encourage our listeners to to go check them out. Well, thank you so much for coming on the show. It was a pleasure to have you. Well, thank you for inviting me. I'm uh, always happy to talk about Spirit's podcast. We're uh, hugely passionate about the medium. Mm-hmm.